Hey everyone, uh, today I'll be talking about round optimal MPC from minimal assumptions. This is joint work with Mikhail Shampi, Vipul Goel, Abhishek Jain, and Rafael Ostrovsky. So let's jump right in. Uh, Multi-party computation or MPC is a mechanism that allows parties to compute a joint function over their private inputs by executing a protocol. This involves parties sending messages to one another at the end of which parties are in possession of the output. Since the focus of the talk is around complexity, what is it around? A lot of interaction constitute of every party sending a message to every other party. For efficiency purposes, our goal is to minimize the number of rounds. Obviously, without any security guarantees, this can be trivially done in a single round of communication by parties just simply sending their private inputs to one another. So what is the security property that we want? Intuitively, we want to say that a misbehaving party doesn't learn anything more than just the output of the function. So how is this formalized? We contrast the real world where the protocol is being executed with an ideal world where all the parties simply send their inputs some, to some trusted uh, functionality, which computes the output and sends the output back to all of the parties. And we say a protocol is secure if uh, for every adversary in the real world corrupting some set of parties, there exists an adversary in the ideal world corrupting the same set of parties. This really formalizes uh, this notion that the parties learn nothing but the outputs because in the ideal world, clearly just by definition, the parties learn nothing but the outputs. So there are various settings one could consider for uh, MPC protocols. We consider the following uh, setting. We consider computational security where we require security only against computationally bounded adversaries. We make no assumptions on the number of parties that an adversary can corrupt and these parties can behave arbitrarily. Uh, we focus on black box simulation, where the simulator uses the adversary only in a black box manner without looking at the internal workings of the adversary, and we assume no trust, etc. So the question we really focus on is uh, two part in the sense, can we construct round optimal MPC from minimal assumptions? So the two parts are uh, round optimality and the uh, assumptions have to be minimal. Uh, so what do we know uh, for both of these axes? So this work started with this wonderful work of uh, Yao and uh, Goldreich, Mikali, and Wittgenstein establishing uh, MPC. And there has been subsequently lots of work done there. Uh, Beaver, Mikali, and Rogerway introduced uh, constant round protocols. These were further improved. And the first sort of lower bound or impossibility to result in this domain uh, was by Katz and Ostrovsky, who showed that of four message protocols are impossible for two-party computation. This is in contrast to rounds where in two parties, we think of a message as, um, you know, say, Alice sending a message to Bob or uh, Bob sending a message to Alice. Uh, and uh, Katz and Osorfi ruled out such protocols. And then, then there was a bunch of work improving on the round complexity. And then there's this wonderful work by Garg Mukherjee Pandey and Pauli Pranadu who showed that uh, three rounds are actually impossible for MPC for general functionalities. And they also gave a positive result constructing a five round protocol assuming obfuscation. Uh, this left a gap, which was then resolved uh, uh, under strong sub exponential assumptions, which again were improved to strong number theoretic assumptions, but only polynomial time assumptions. Uh, so clearly we have uh, now in terms of total number of rounds, we have round optimal protocols under polynomial time assumptions. So we want minimal assumptions. So what is the minimality for constructing uh, MPC? It turns out uh, from this wonderful work by Killian uh, and subsequently by others, that oblivious transfer is a necessary and sufficient uh, condition for MPC. And this tightness was sort of observed uh, to a large extent by Ben Hamuda and Lin, who showed that K round OT protocols imply K round MPC. Uh, the only caveat being K has to be at least uh, five. So this left the gap of what about four round protocols. And our result finally closes this uh, long uh, line of work, which has seen some recent exciting development by showing that four round oblivious transfer protocols uh, imply four round MPC. So what kind of security properties do we require from uh, this oblivious transfer protocol? We require indistinguishability security against a malicious sender and extraction of a receiver bit. So the security properties are actually quite mild. So what makes this a hard problem? Uh, we all illustrate one such problem below, which we call uh, protecting the fourth round message. Consider any four round protocol computing of function f that's run between Alice and Bob. 
So let's now say that uh, Alice is a malicious adversary. In fact, Alice is a malicious rushing adversary. So what is the rushing adversary? Alice may decide to not send its message after it sees Bob's message. So for instance, in the fourth round, uh, Bob sends his message. Alice looks at Bob's message and decides not to send her message. Uh, and Alice at this point has all the information to compute the output. Uh, and in this uh, manner, only Alice learns the output, but while Bob perhaps doesn't have enough information to compute the output. By itself, this is a denial of service attack, which doesn't seem too bad. Uh, but, you know, we said Alice can behave maliciously. In fact, in the first three rounds, she could have behaved maliciously and forced the function being computed instead of the function f to the identity function. And in this case, uh, Alice learning the output means Bob's input is revealed because the identity function on Bob's input is Bob's input itself. So to protect against this, uh, Bob really wants to not send his fourth round message unless Alice can prove her honest behavior. So how this is typically done is that Alice convinces Bob of her honest behavior via zero knowledge proofs before Bob sends his fourth round message. Given that uh, Alice needs to convince Bob before he sends his fourth round message, we require three round zero knowledge proofs. Unfortunately, in this uh, seminal work by Goldreich and Krosik, they show that it's impossible to have three round zero knowledge proof with black box simulation, which is the uh, setting that we are in. So, uh, I, I want to say that there are many, many challenges in constructing four-round protocols, but in this talk, we'll focus on solving this challenge. So to do so, we're going to construct what are known as multi-party conditional disclosure of secrets. Uh, so what is a conditional disclosure of secrets? So given a message, it's a mechanism which allows us to sort of encrypt the message uh, such that given a witness uh, that satisfies the condition, you can actually decrypt the message. So the witness, in some sense, acts as the key. So conditional disclosure of secrets or CDS has a long and story first, starting with these works of Gertner, Ishai, Kishilovitz, and Malkin, and it's uh, spawned an area of itself. So how do we use CDS as a safety net uh, to uh, attempt to solve the problem that I illustrated earlier? So here what Bob does is Bob uh, encrypts the, his fourth round message using the CDS and sends it to Alice. And the condition is that it will only decrypt as long as Alice can prove that she behaved honestly. So how does Alice prove honest behavior? She says, oh, here's my input and randomness explaining honest behavior in these first three rounds. Great, so this seems to work for two parties, but does it work for more than two parties? Uh, now consider the setting that Carol uh, sends her fourth round message to both Alice and Bob. And consider the setting specifically where, uh, you know, Alice and Bob were colluding, uh, Bob behaved maliciously. Alice uh, behaved honestly, even though she's a malicious party. So Alice does have a witness for her honest behavior in the first three rounds, while Bob doesn't. So what Alice can do is Alice, because she has a valid witness, can actually decrypt the message that Carol sends and sends it across to Bob. So now Bob learns uh, Carol's fourth round message, even though he behaved maliciously. This is something that we really want to avoid. So instead of uh, locally proving that uh, you behaved honestly, we want it to be the case that the witness is that everyone behaved honestly. And obviously for privacy reasons, we can't allow everyone's input and randomness to be the witness. So instead what we really want is a public witness that's present at the end of the fourth round because the decryption only needs to be done after the fourth round. Uh, so this really get, gets this four round zero knowledge proof back into question because, oh, so what Alice and Bob can do is uh, they can you know, uh, complete the four round zero knowledge proof uh, and send the fourth round uh, to one another at the end of the protocol. And then both Alice and Bob collect all the proofs, not just uh, from the two parties, but in the multi-party setting from all other parties. And the witness is going to correspond to everyone's proof. And Carol's uh, message is only going to be decrypted if all of the proofs are uh, uh, verified. Okay, so this seems to work, uh, but we really care about uh, the actual assumptions that are required to build CDS because we said, you know, our uh, goal is two pronged that we want to minimize the number of rounds, but also want to minimize the assumptions that we need. So, how do we implement CDS? Uh, unfortunately, for non interactive realization uh, of CDS, the only way we know how to do it is by witness encryption, which is known only assuming 
indistinguishable obfuscation, uh, which is a far cry from uh, oblivious transfer. So this, while this does solve uh, one aspect of our goal, this doesn't give us the minimal assumption. So the main point to note is that we said our oh, you know, non-interactive realization which is encryption, but we have a few rounds to work with. Specifically, we have four rounds to work with. So can we have an interactive version of the CDS? And we'll actually construct uh, an interactive version of the CDS assuming two primitives, uh, which are oblivious transfer and garbage circuit. So I've talked about oblivious transfer a lot. So what is oblivious transfer? Oblivious transfer allows the sender that has uh, two inputs, x0 and x1, just think of them as single bits for now, and the receiver has a single bit B. So the sender and the receiver run a protocol at the end of which the receiver has XB and uh, she learns nothing about X1 minus B and the sender in turn learns nothing about the bit B. And this can actually be done in four rounds. And the second component that we're going to require is garbled circuits, uh, which takes in an input and a circuit and pr uh, performs this uh, garbling procedure, which gives you a garbled input and a garbled circuit. Uh, why is garbling useful? It's nice in the sense that if uh, the circuit has some secret information, then the garbling uh, sort of uh, hides the secret information. So how do we use oblivious transfer and garbled circuit to actually compute the interactive CDS? For now, think of the witness as a single bit. It can uh, easily extend to multiple bits. So the sender wants to send uh, this message uh, or encrypt this message and send it along to the receiver. So what the sender does is it creates a circuit which takes in an input witness. And if the witness satisfies some condition, it outputs the message, otherwise uh, it does. So uh, the sender gobbles the circuit, uh, but you know, in the gobbling procedure, we show that the input is gobbled too. Unfortunately, the sender doesn't know what the receiver's input is, and uh, we don't want the receiver to send the input directly to the sender. So what they do is essentially agree on running uh, an oblivious transfer protocol where the sender first computes the garbled input for both bits, say both garbled input for zero and garbled input for one, and uses that as his input to the oblivious transfer protocol. So at the end of the oblivious transfer protocol where the receiver uses her witness as the input, she learns the corresponding garbled input to the witness. And then Bob can send over the garbled circuit, and then receiver can evaluate this garbled circuit. And as long as the witness satisfies this condition, she'll actually learn the message. Okay, so how do we use the interactive CDS to protect the fourth round in the MPC? So here uh, is what we have Alice has as witness uh, all the collected proofs, uh, and Bob wants to protect his fourth round, so he's going to put the fourth round inside of the garbled circuit. And then they run an OT protocol. Uh, so the problem here is if you actually look at uh, the direction of the OT protocol messages, it turns out that Alice actually needs to decide her receiver input by the third round of the OT, because that's the last round that she sends a message. So now this goes back to us requiring three rounds zero knowledge proofs, because as you said, uh, the witness has to be a public witness, and we said we want to work with zero knowledge proofs. And unfortunately, we've uh, reached this point where Alice seems to require the proofs in the third round, meaning all the zero knowledge proofs must complete in the third round. Okay, so this seems to be a problem. We seem to have done a whole, whole lot of work to come back to this point where we require three rounds of zero knowledge proofs, but there are a few points to know. One is that uh, we require zero knowledge in the simultaneous message which is to say that you know three message zero knowledge is uh, ruled out by Goldreich and Cauchy, uh, but three round uh, zero knowledge where in each round both parties send the message is still conceivably something we could work with. And the second property that we require uh, or we observe is that um, the third round of the zero knowledge proof is actually hidden uh, inside of the OT message. And in fact, is not even revealed until the fourth round of the MPC. So uh, if Bob actually were to abort and not say, for instance, send his fourth round of the message, uh, then the fourth round, uh, then the third round of the zero knowledge is completely hidden. Uh, so we're essentially taking a three round protocol and repurposing it to work in four rounds. So, okay, so these seem like relaxed requirements uh, that we want from a zero knowledge group. Do we actually have a zero knowledge group that satisfies these constructions? And it turns out it does. 
So this wonderful work by Madhina and Goel, Jain, Kalai, Khurana and Sahai showed that assuming just oblivious transfer, there exists three round zero knowledge protocols that exist in the simultaneous message model that are secure against verifiers who do not evolve. This is exactly what we need. Because as long as uh, you know the verifier abort, we actually don't need to reveal the third round of the mess of the zero knowledge protocol. So this is great. So what we can do essentially is uh, now have an interactive CDS where uh, Alice uses as her input the promise ZK, which goes into the third round, and Bob uses as his input uh, the fourth round of the message, and then Alice only learns. Uh, Bob's message as long as the CDS uh, verifies. Okay. So uh, we've seen issues in the two-party, uh, multi-party set, going from the two-party to multi-party setting before. So how does uh, it all work in the multi-party setting? It's essentially the same thing. So Carol here on the left uh, puts in her input as the fourth round message. Um, Alice and Bob both separately can actually put in their uh, promise ZK proofs. Uh, and everyone gets the uh, Carol's fourth round message as long as all the proofs like. And this can be actually uh, extended quite simply from the two, two party protocol. Okay, so what about uh, the full protocol? I have shown you sort of one issue and one component and how we solve this. Uh, and this already had multiple components. So our full protocol actually has lots of many moving components. Uh, there are several non-malleability challenges. So these are typically challenges when um, you want to construct protocols in a few rounds. Uh, you want to ensure that um, honest party's input is not some uh, uh, somehow mauled to get the adversarial input. Specifically, you want the honest party inputs to be independent of the adversary inputs. And since we're talking about black box simulation, here the simulator gains an advantage over other parties by being able to rewind the adversary. So this is typically used when extracting the adversary's input. And uh, to allow for the simulator to rewind the adversary, we need to have primitives that are secure in the presence of rewind. Uh, specifically, we uh, construct an OT protocol that retains security in the presence of a bounded number of rewinds. And this is a new construction. And this is done assuming only regular OT. Uh, let me just give you a high level idea of what this is, uh, of a, what a bounded rewind secure OT. So what is even a bounded rewind secure primitive? So in a typical uh, challenger adversary game, the challenger and adversary play this game where they exchange messages after which you know the challenger, the adversary uh, outputs something and there is a win condition. In the bounded rewind uh, challenger adversary game, the adversary is allowed to send say here the third round messages uh, multiple times and the challenger has to respond to each of these third round messages. And we say it's k-bounded if the challenger is allowed to, uh, if the adversary is allowed to make k different queries to which the challenger has to respond. And we want the same security property to hold even if the adversary is allowed to query k different times. So let's consider the simple case of uh, a four round, uh, one rewind secure OT. So the adversary is allowed to ask, make two queries uh, to the challenger. Uh, so here we have uh, the receiver with bit B and the sender with uh, X0 and X1. And the property we want is that the receiver input should be hidden, even if an adversarial sender is allowed to rewind once. So the adversarial sender is allowed to see essentially two separate executions. And we want it to be the case that the receiver security still holds. So the main intuition is that we run sort of two parallel copies of the OT. Uh, and the receiver picks a random OT in the third round to proceed with, and the other OT is never executed. So the first two rounds of both OTs are executed, and the receiver in the third round picks, hey, I'm going to pick the left OT. And she does this randomly and continues with the left OT, while the right OT is never completed. Uh, so how is this uh, sort of useful to the challenger? What the challenger can do is that in the two different instances, it can say for in the first instance, it runs the left OT and in the second instance, it runs the right OT. So then therefore each OT is run only a single time and you can rely on the security of the OT. The problem with this approach, even though it seems to work is that it leads to bias transfer. And why is that? Because the challenger's choice in one execution determines the choice in the other. What we really want it to be the case is that the challenger can randomly pick for each execution, which OT she wants to. 
Okay. Uh, so how do we actually get that? The high level idea is to secret share the receiver's input. So what Alice does is uh, her input B, she secret, secret shares into like uh, two shares or N shares in general. Let's think of it simply for two shares. She uses her input B1, share B1 in the first execution um, with, and the input B2 in the second execution. And each of these executions are, as you saw before, um, Alice in the first index, let's say first index, uh, runs two parallel executions of the OT and in the third round decides, hey, I'm going to pick the left one. And in the second index, which corresponds to B2, she again runs uh, two parallel executions. And this one, she randomly decides to pick uh, the right execution. And why is this nice? Because in the, uh, the challenger cannot independently sample which instance to use for each index. So for the first index, she randomly samples one of them uh, and the second index, uh, randomly samples one. And she does this in independently for each execution. So the biasness is sort of gone. And the security holds as long as there's one index that results in two different executions. So as long as there's one index that results in two different executions, you can rely on the OT security in that index. And secret sharing guarantees as, as long as one index or one share is secure, uh, the overall input is secure. Of course, uh, this is only a high level idea. There are lots of details missing. How do you reconstruct and so on and so forth? And we defer all the details to the paper. Uh, so to summarize, uh, we actually construct a four round MPC protocol, assuming just a four round OT. And this is optimal in both the number of rounds and assumptions. Uh, so thanks a lot for listening. If you have any questions, please speak, feel free to send me an email. Uh, the link for the ePrint is here. You can always find me anytime on chat uh, during the, the live talk at ECC and ask me questions there too. Thanks a lot.